Does renewable energy have a viable economic future? What does that mean for investors? Joining us now with their insight and perspective, we have Gordon Johnson. He covers the solar sector for Axiom Capital, and he's been bearish on the shares of First Solar. Also joining us, Amory Lovins. He's the co-founder, chairman, and chief scientist at the Rocky Mountain Institute. He's also the author of Reinventing Fire. Gentlemen, good to have you with us. Gordon, let's start off. Just want to get your thoughts on what's going on at First Solar. The CEO leaves the company. The co-founder and chairman steps in, says he's going to run it for a while. Why did the CEO leave? Well, I think there's a lot of speculation around why Mr. Gillette left for solar. But um, our personal view is either uh, it, it's the two-prong, uh, basically, explanation. Number one is um, he was asked to sign off on financial statements that he may not be willing to sign off on, given this is the first quarter that First Solar is going to start to recognize significant revenues um, that are effectively a pull-in of revenues on projects that are a percentage of completion. So effectively, First Solar's EPS is going from $0.70 cents to $2.25 from Q2 to Q3, and a quarter that everybody else is going to be losing money. So they're pulling in a lot of revenue. And that may be the one reason. The other reason may be, you know, he's just sees the writing on the wall. Their contracts in next year. The stock has went from 150 to 55, and he doesn't want to be at the helm of a company that's maybe going to go from 55 to significantly lower. We think the, la uh, the former of those two reasons is more more than likely, but one of those two reasons is likely. What about subsidies <clears throat> for solar companies right now? We know that the Chinese government has been putting a lot of money behind the production of uh, solar panels and various solar. Uh, products. Is that just here to stay? Is that the only way to make these companies profitable? What the Chinese government has done for all of their commodity industries, not just solar, is they provide low electricity, low labor, and um, that allows their companies to produce at, a, produce at a very low cost. So solar is a commodity. It's not highly technical. So the Chinese government's providing that money. And with respect to the subsidies, every country is significantly cutting back subsidies. And without subsidies, solar is more expensive, expensive than you know, fossil fuel-based electricity. And that's why you're seeing a significant pullback in demand. Amory Lovins, talk a little bit about subsidies here in the United States. Are they necessary for renewable energy to grow? The purpose of the renewable subsidies is to uh, try to offset the generally larger and permanent subsidies given to non-renewable resources. As it happens, uh, solar already uh, is winning the power auctions in California because its levelized cost is below that of a new combined cycle gas plant. In a dozen states now, entrepreneurs will put uh, Chinese or American or whatever solar panels on your roof with no money down and beat your utility bill. And th that turns into an unregulated virtual utility business that, you know, gives utility executives the heebie-jeebies but gives uh, venture capitalists sweet dreams. I, I would much rather see the whole energy sector desubsidized. We're not there. It is hugely and very uh, distortively subsidized. But I think the big picture is very interesting and very bullish for renewables. Namely, over the next 40 years, we have to rebuild our whole electricity system. It is aging, obsolescent, insecure. And no matter what we rebuild it with, technology of your choice, it's going to cost about $6 trillion net present value. However, different futures differ vastly in risk, financial, fuel, climate, uh, technological, uh, security risks, all kinds. And what we found in Reinventing Fire is if you go to a distributed renewable future, which is where the market is very rapidly headed, clean energy is a $200 billion a year business worldwide, the U.S. lags. If we, if we do that in, in the right way, we can manage all of those risks. It doesn't cost any more. Uh, everybody involved is going to make money because they'll be building the core industries of the 21st century. Gordon Johnson, what about the valuations of solar stocks? Because you as an investor, you could say, all right, I'm bullish on the future for renewable energy, but at the same time, just take a look at the actual valuation and give yourself some questions. Right. So what people are valuing solar stocks on today is price to book value multiples because we're not certain on what the earnings are going to be. However, all of these companies uh, are going to lose money in Q3 and potentially Q4. And additionally, Pim, because polysilicon
look at solar wafers, solar cells, solar module prices are down so much, they're going to have to write down inventory. So that's going to be a loss on the net income line, which is negative for your retained earnings and that's your book value. So if you're valuing these companies on book value, that's not the right metric. We think DCF is the right metric. And when you look at DCF, discounted, discounted cash flow analysis, and when you look at that, these companies still have significant downside. All right. Well, Amory Lovins, you were just describing subsidies, government subsidies, not only for renewable energy sources, but for existing, let's say, fossil fuel energy sources, such as coal or natural gas or indeed oil. I mean, how realistic is it that those subsidies are going to go away, and isn't it more likely that the renewable energy industry just wants the same kind of deal from the government that other energy companies get? It would like to have as good a deal as the other energy sources get. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> what we have now is kind of a uh, zoo in which whoever has the biggest campaign contributions and the most political influence gets the biggest subsidies with, uh, we found years ago, over 200-fold differences in the intensity of subsidy between more and less favored technology. So I would love to see them all go away, run the subsidy arms race backwards, the right number is zero. Uh, and let all ways to save or produce energy compete fairly at honest prices, no matter which they are, what technology, how big, uh, where they are, or who owns them. That's the opposite of what I, we got I, now. Amory, I understand that, but, uh, but my question is how realistic is that? I mean, do you really think that's going to happen with the way that Washington politics works? And if it's not realistic, aren't we just looking for more subsidies for renewable energy? Uh, I don't think we are, uh, because renewables have such steep learning curves, their costs are dropping very fast. The, the new wind power contracts nowadays are being written at about three cents a kilowatt hour. That's net of a subsidy with a levelized value of one cent. So without subsidy, it's four cents. That's still a winner. And by the way, it's even cheaper in countries with consistent policy because the wind tax credit is a political pawn. Every year or two, Congress dithers, and that drives up risk and cost. So the result is that last year, their dithering cut our wind installations in the U.S. in half. Now everybody's racing to catch up. And meanwhile, last year, China blew past its 2020 wind power targets. It installed almost half the world's new wind power. It doubled its capacity for about the fifth year running. And this is a more general issue. Uh, this kind of uh, very inconsistent, unpredictable policy environment has taken the U.S. from number one to number two to number three in clean energy investment the past three years. So the past five years, uh, we went from nine to ten percent renewable electricity, while, let's say, Portugal went from seventeen percent to forty-five percent. Gordon Johnson, now, if Amory is correct and the cost of renewable energy is dropping, why would this be good for private investors? I mean, why not just make this the domain of the government in order to jumpstart a new industry? Well, I think there's a fundamental flaw with the argument, and I think the fundamental flaw is both wind power and solar power are peak load intermittent power, meaning when the wind stops blowing or when the sun goes down, you have to shift that power usage to a natural gas turbine type uh, combustion uh, facility. You can't so, store it in some kind of battery exactly. facility? So, although the cost of wind, and, and not solar, but the cost of wind may be competitive, um, when you talk about levelized cost of energy models, you're comparing the production cost of wind and solar to the retail cost of fossil-based electricity. Between production and retail, there's a bunch of other costs included that when you include those costs, the costs of both wind and solar are exorbitantly higher. But more importantly, Pim, they're intermittent peak load sources of energy. They're not base load distributed like fossil fuel, like natural gas. If we want power all day, we have to look for a more distributed um, form of uh, energy usage. And I think that's the fundamental flaw in the argument. I want to thank you, gentlemen, very much. Gordon Johnson joining us from Axiom Capital Management. Amory Lovins joining us from the Rocky Mountain Institute. Cut off before being able to respond, Amory Lovins replies online at rmi.org. In his closing remark, uh, Gordon Johnson claimed there was a fundamental flaw in the economics of competitive uh, solar and wind power and uh, <clears throat> claimed that uh, I had somehow messed up the economics by not counting that wind and solar are, as he said, peak load intermittent power rather than base load distributed power. There are not huge added costs to integrating variable renewables, namely solar, photovoltaics, and wind, into the grid. These costs are well known because a lot of people are doing it already. Four states in Germany were 43 to 52 percent wind powered last year, for example. 
and the integration costs are typically a few percent. They may well be lower than the costs of integrating the truly intermittent resources, the ones that fail without warning, namely coal and nuclear plants into the grid, because to be able to uh, cope with their losing a billion watts in milliseconds, often for weeks or months, you have to uh, have typically a 15 or 20 percent reserve margin and spending reserve and a, a number of other uh, features that are very expensive. It's like if you keep elephants, uh, one of them might die in your living room and you need a standby elephant to haul it away and standby elephants are expensive and eat a lot. Uh, so uh, if you take a symmetrical view, as we do, of renewable and non-renewable generators distributed and centralized, you quickly reach the conclusion that is the, it's the distributed renewable ones that have superior uh, resilience uh, and reliability and similar or better economics. Uh, that is, this is, of course, what the market has concluded, putting $151 billion of capital into those non-hydro renewables last year alone worldwide. Thank you.